Welcome to lecture 34. So far, we've done only one-dimensional flows. Now we'll discuss oblique shocks. This will be our first case of two-dimensional flows in compressible flow. We'll begin to derive some of the equations for 2D oblique shocks. By way of introduction, here are various flows where you find oblique shocks. Bullets traveling through air, these are oblique shocks. Supersonic aircraft in a wind tunnel. Here you see all these oblique shocks. Here's a cylinder in a wind tunnel. This is a bow shock, which is normal at first, but then becomes oblique later on. This is actually a reflected oblique shock. This oblique shock from the bow wave hits the wall and reflects off. We'll discuss reflected oblique shocks later. We also see oblique shocks in supersonic inlets. Here's a color Schlieren image, and you see all these oblique shocks at this sharp point in the cowling. We also see oblique shocks when you have a wedge in a supersonic flow. Here's an overexpanded nozzle. We can tell it's overexpanded because the jet narrows down as it comes out. Here we see oblique shocks, normal shocks, and even some expansion fans. Here's a diagram of how this works. We have oblique shocks, normal shocks, and we get expansion fans, which are actually the reverse of a shock. Pressure rises across a shock, but pressure decreases across an expansion fan. These flows can get very complicated, and there are reflections in everything. There is actually an expansion fan up here that's pretty visible around this corner. The pressure rises across the oblique shock and then decreases slowly through the expansion fan. First, let's do a qualitative analysis of oblique shocks. Our assumptions and approximations are 2D, ideal gas. We'll ignore boundary layers on walls. So our flow will be isentropic except through the shocks. I'll compare a normal shock and an oblique shock. The normal shock from 1 to 2 with flow from left to right, we know that M1 is greater than 1 and M2 is less than 1, and the streamlines just go straight through the shock. When we have an oblique shock, we still have one in front and two behind the shock, but the streamlines actually turn at angle theta from the horizontal. The shock itself is at some angle beta. Beta is called the shock angle, and theta is the turning angle. M1 still has to be bigger than one, you can get shocks only in supersonic flow. But M2 can be less than 1 or greater than 1, depending on M1, beta, and theta. Let's consider, for example, a 2D wedge of half-angle delta. And this wedge is aligned directly into the flow, with Mach number 1 coming in. We'll get an oblique shock right at the nose of shock angle beta. And as we sketched up here, the flow will turn at turning angle theta. But the flow after the turn has to be parallel to the wedge, since the wedge is a solid wall, and we're ignoring boundary layers. So here, theta has to equal delta. There are, in general, three angles when we deal with oblique shocks in 2D flow. Theta is the turning angle or the deflection angle. Beta is the shock angle, and delta is the wedge half angle. But as I said, theta is equal to delta when we ignore boundary layers. When flow comes through the shock, it slows down. So M2 is less than M1, but as I said, M2 is not necessarily subsonic. Oblique shocks have similar overall behavior as normal shocks. The pressure increases across the shock from 1 to 2. As with the normal shock, temperature increases, density increases, specific entropy increases. But like a normal shock, stagnation temperature stays the same, but stagnation pressure decreases. And as we've already said, M2 is less than M1. It turns out that all our equations for normal shocks still apply, but we must account for the angles. Before I get into the equations, I just want to compare an oblique shock to a Mach wave. 
Recall we discussed the sound wave in supersonic flow, where we had a noise source in supersonic flow. But as soon as the sound is made, its sound waves travel downstream and are tangent to a line, which we called a Mach wave. So if you're standing here, you would never hear that sound. You hear the sound only if you're within this Mach wave region. The Mach wave angle is mu, which you may recall is the arc sine of 1 over m, where we call that the Mach angle. A Mach wave is actually an infinitesimally weak oblique shock. In fact, it's isentropic. The turning angle theta is zero. The flow passes straight through the Mach wave without being deflected. In fact, nothing changes across this infinitesimally weak oblique shock since it's isentropic. Shock angle beta is simply mu in this case. And m1 is equal to m2. In other words, there's no change. Now let's replace this noise source by our 2D wedge of half angle delta. Now we get our oblique shock and the flow does turn by angle theta and the shock itself is at angle beta. The purpose of this comparison is to show that beta is always greater than mu. In other words, mu is the lower limit of beta. In this lower limit the flow was isentropic but when you have an actual oblique shock it's no longer isentropic. When an aircraft flies supersonically, oblique shocks form and travel along the ground with the aircraft. As we discussed before, a person standing on the ground does not hear or feel anything until the plane moves far enough forward that the oblique shock passes by. Then he or she hears a sonic boom with a sudden increase in pressure. The actual flow around this aircraft is complicated and there's usually another oblique shock later. So often you hear two sonic booms in a row. Now let's start to look at oblique shocks quantitatively. Here's our oblique shock with one before the shock and two after. We'll let V1 be the velocity approaching the shock. The shock itself is inclined at shock angle beta and the flow turns at some smaller angle, the turning angle theta. Let's split this velocity v1 into two components, v1t which is tangent to the shock and v1n which is normal to the shock. We'll do the same with v2. v2n will be smaller than v1n across the shock and v2t will be the same as v1t. v2 is the vector sum of these two components. Doing a little bit of trig this angle is beta minus theta. This angle is beta. So we can write V1n equal V1 sine beta. V1 tangential, V1t, is V1 cosine beta. V2n is V2 sine beta minus theta. And V2t is V2 times cosine beta minus theta. But as I said, the tangential velocity components are not affected by the shock. So V1t equal V2t. This is the key to our quantitative analysis. Namely, the tangential component of the oblique shock is not affected by the shock. The flow tangential to the shock is the same on both sides. Thus, our old normal shock equations still apply, but in terms of the normal component of velocity. Not V1, but V1n. This allows us to calculate all the property changes across the oblique shock. I'll illustrate with a small control volume. Here's our oblique shock from 1 to 2, and here's a slice of a control volume across the shock. V1n is the normal component coming into the control volume and V2n is the normal component coming out. But V1t and V2t are the same, and they move parallel to the shock into the control volume and don't change. Therefore, the same flow comes out the control volume. 
Let's define this face area as A. Now we can write our conservation equations. Conservation of mass on this control volume gives us rho 1 V1 N A through this normal component. The normal component at the inlet equal rho 2 V2 N A at the outlet in the normal direction. In the tangential direction, the same flow comes in as comes out. And since the area is the same, we have rho 1 V1 N equal rho 2 V2 N, which I'll call equation 1. For the momentum equation, nothing changes at all in the tangential direction, so we need to consider only the normal direction. If we call this face area A, we have P1 A acting in this direction, and an opposing P2 acting in that direction, opposite, and we expect P2 to be larger. So our momentum equation is P1A minus P2A equals sum over all the outlets of m dot Vn, the normal direction, minus the sum over all the inlets of m dot Vn. So this is the momentum equation in the normal direction only, while m dot is rho 2 V2N times A, as we saw up here, and Vn is V2N at the outlet. At the inlet, m dot is rho 1 v1 n a from here, and v n is v1 n. And the pressure force is p1 a minus p2 a, and there's an area in each term which cancels. So our momentum equation reduces to p1 minus p2 equal rho 2 v2 n squared minus rho 1 v1 n squared. We'll call that equation 2. Conservation of energy tells us that stagnation enthalpy must remain constant. So specific stagnation enthalpy H01 equals specific stagnation enthalpy H02. For an ideal gas, this reduces to stagnation temperatures being equal as well. Well, recall that H0 is H plus 1 half V squared. But this V squared is the total velocity magnitude squared. And scrolling up, we see that V1 squared is V1 T squared plus V1 N squared. Similarly, V2 squared is V2 N squared plus V2 T squared, since these are right triangles. So our enthalpy equation can be written out as H01 equal H1 plus 1 half V1 N squared plus 1 half V1 T squared equal H2 plus 1 half V2 N squared plus 1 half V2 T squared, which is equal to H02. But V1 T equal V2 T, so these two terms cancel and thus our energy equation reduces to H1 plus 1 half V1 N squared equal H2 plus 1 half V2 N squared, and I'll call that equation 3. Now I want to compare the normal shock equations and the oblique shock equations. These are the mass, momentum, and energy equations for a normal shock that we've been using for many weeks now, and these are the three equations that we just derived for the oblique shock. You can see that these equations are identical if we replace V1 by V1n in all three of these equations, and V2 by V2n. Let me look at different frames of references to try to make this more clear. In the typical stationary frame of reference, we have the oblique shock, V1, with turning angle theta and shock angle beta, of course, one before the shock and two after the shock. Now let's rotate this whole thing by 90 degrees minus beta, which will make, in our rotated frame of reference, the shock be vertical. So V1 comes in at this angle, V2 at this angle. We still have 1 and 2 across the shock, and I split the velocities into the two components on each side. This angle is beta minus theta, and the shock angle is here, beta. Now we take this rotated frame of reference and we move up at speed V1t, or V2t, since they're the same. Now what do we see? Now it looks like a typical normal shock from 1 to 2, with some flow coming in and some flow coming out. So imagine that you're a camera moving up at this tangential speed V1t. This is what you would see. You would see exactly a typical normal shock. You wouldn't see any tangential speed since you're moving at that same speed. So it's no wonder that these equations are identical if we replace these speeds with the normal components. Let's write some equations for M1n and M2n. M1n, the normal component of Mach number, 
is V1N over A1, which is V1 sine beta over A1, but this is M1, so M1N is M1 sine beta. I'll call that equation 4. M2N is similar, V2N over A2, or V2 sine beta minus theta over A2, so M2N is M2 sine beta minus theta. So the bottom line is that we can use the same normal shock equations that we used before, except with M1N instead of M1, and M2N instead of M2. For example, we had an expression for P2 over P1 as a function of M1 and gamma for a normal shock. Well, for an oblique shock, we can use the identical equation, except use M1N instead of M1. I'll close with this comment. Since we've transformed into a normal shock, by rotating and moving, we must have M1N greater than 1, and we must have M2N less than 1. A shock still must go from supersonic to subsonic flow, even if it's oblique. But for an oblique shock, the actual M2 can be less than, equal to, or greater than 1. Thank you for watching this video. Please subscribe to my YouTube channel for more videos.